thanks for the introduction, Sarah. Today we have Maria Gallegos Herrera, California State Director for USDA R Rural Development, sharing her thoughts on reinvesting in rural infrastructure. It's a lot of rural. She began serving as California State Director for USDA Rural Development in June 2022 after serving as the California, the Central California Regional Director of External Affairs for, the gov for Governor Newsom's office. Gallegos Herrera previously worked as a community development manager at Self Help Enterprises, a nationally recognized community development organization dedicated to working with low income families to build and sustain healthy communities. And I'm back. Um, all right, so to kick things off, can you just give us a brief uh, overview, Maria, of the California office and some of the biggest highlights here that we should be looking out for? Certainly, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I am a, a truly delighted to be a voice for USDA Rural Development and for President Biden um, because the work that we do at Rural Development is just so important and so personal to me as someone who grew up in the rural communities in the San Joaquin Valley and as someone who has such deep connection to agriculture. Um, a little bit about rural development, as you all know, we're a federal agency. We are focused on improving the economy and, and quality of life in rural America. We have more than 70 programs that touch all aspects of rural development. We, we often say that through the collective of our programs, we could literally build a community from the ground up. So we have programs that allow us to cons construct or support important community places like community centers, childcare, rural hospitals. We also support and provide loans for economic development and utilities like water, electricity, and internet access. Um, we also pride ourselves in being able to help rural residents either buy or rent affordable homes. And um, we also do a lot in um, the space of improving uh, telehealth medicine and um, distance learning. At the national office level, our programs are structured in sort of three main agencies. You probably hear about them, the Rural Housing Service, uh, rural, rural, cooperatives, um, rural Business Cooperative Services, and Rural Utility Services. So here in California, we have <coughs> a total of 18 offices. And we're uniquely uh, located in some of the rural areas. And one of the things that really sets us apart is that the folks that work for rural development live um, in these communities. So again, our, the mission is very, very personal um, to us. And just in terms of priorities uh, under, under the, this administration and Secretary Vilsack, we're focused on three main priorities, and that is really improving access to our programs and making sure that folks are benefiting, whether you're a rural community, a tribe, or as the previous speaker was mentioning, how hard it is to access our programs. We also wanna work with ag producers, um, especially those, the smaller uh, minority ag producers. And then um, really focusing on reducing the climate change pollution and increasing resiliency through through economic support for communities and also helping communities recover economically through uh, more and better market opportunities. Great, yeah, we're gonna have Karen Ross here later today and she'll talk a lot about the ties between rural development and agriculture and how it's such a huge issue in California. So as we were talking before this, you were, saying, you were talking about one of the biggest programs being the Rural Energy for America program, REAP. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an overview of the latest developments on this? Sure, and I'll say that I mentioned we have 70 programs, but under the Rural Business Cooperative Service area, we have at least four key programs, uh, the Rural Energy for America being one of them, which I can start with that. So the Rural Energy for America program is a program that's uh, designed to support agricultural producers and rural businesses that are looking to expand the use of renewable energy, um, such as uh, wind, solar, um, and, all, or if, and or if they're looking to uh, implement energy efficiency projects. And the idea with, with these um, innovations is that we wanna help them uh, be able to cut electricity costs that will re you know, put money back in their pocket that can help them grow their business and also contribute to the climate change um, goals. 
as you know, the president has been really focused on working with Congress to pass legislation that have, has allowed us to make historic investments and through the Inflation Reduction Act, we were able to get a lot additional funds that really allowed us to uh, make really key improvements to the Rural Energy America program that will benefit uh, and create more access for ag producers and rural businesses. And some of those things I wanna make sure you're aware of is that with these new funds, we, one, were able to increase the federal um, grant share from 25% to 50% of the project cost. We were also able to uh, fund uh, technical assistance, so we do have a couple of technical assistance providers in California that you can work with to access these dollars. And then third, we uh, moved away from annual solicitations to uh, accepting applications on a quarterly basis, so now you can uh, work with um, your team to submit your applications and with us, with us, and you have more than one opportunity a year. We're right now accepting applications through uh, for this program and through September 30th of this year. Okay, great. So we're talking uh, the types of projects, energy uh, or energy efficiency for uh, irrigation pumps. Um, can you share any success stories? Any any big ones that stand out for you? Uh, certainly, um, we have. Uh, most of the projects has either been uh, agricultural producers coming to us to obtain the funding to do like biodigesters. Um, in other instances, we've done uh, a lot of solar rooftops or um, pump retrofits as well. And as I was mentioning, we have, um, we've been <laughs> actually funding quite a bit in, in California. Uh, most recently, I believe we announced a pretty big announcement in late March that was, uh, we're investing about six million um, in those renewable energy projects really throughout the entire state. Uh, an example that comes to mind is the Ericsson Farms. It's an almond producer in Madeira. We provided them a uh, $1 million investment uh, to install solar panels, um, which is predicted to produce over 1.8 million kilowatts hours of electricity per year. So pretty significant. Nice, yeah, solar panels. I think a lot of folks have been tapping into that over the years as energy rates have been going up. Uh, so yeah, you kind of touched on it a little bit before, but when we're talking about accessing some of these programs, it's always a challenge for farmers, especially some of these small farmers we've talked about. Uh, what kind of help, what kind of assistance do you have for this? Um, so we understand that uh, navigating uh, federal state programs can be a challenge, and we, we really wanna simplify the process to the extent that we can. So a couple of things I wanna highlight is one, as I mentioned, we have a, a team of, of specialists based throughout the state of California. Um, specifically for the business programs, we have a team that you can contact. Uh, if you go on our website, we do have a listing of the, the staff individuals assigned to specific counties or programs. We're always available to answer questions um, through the program like Rural Energy for America. Uh, like I mentioned, we uh, obtain funding to hire two, uh, two technical assistance providers. Uh, one is the Agritech Energy LLC. They're based out of Tracy, and they primarily focus on helping ag producers um, or rural businesses be able to access the REAP dollars. They uh, focus on like ag punk retrofits. They can help you with the application, answer questions about the project and uh, also a program and also help with the environmental checklist. And then the second technical assistance provider that we have for REAP is the Imperial Regional Alliance. They're down in the southern part of the state in Imperial and they too can help with the application, SAMS registration, and again, they focus both on the renewable energy system projects and the energy efficiency. Um, I know that there's also a lot of work happening at the national level to uh, Im improve the application process for the Rural Energy for America pro program, but also for the Value Added Producer Grant program, which I know the other speaker was mentioning about the importance in investing in helping agricultural producers be able to add value to their products and the value added producer grant program that we offer is is a way to help you um, you know for example if there's a farmer that is a tomato grower and is now looking to create their own brand of salsa or strawberries and turning them into jam we have a program that's offered on an annual solicitation basis that can help you with a lot of the planning or marketing of those products. 
Great. And uh, kind of on that note as well, uh, so we talk a lot about state programs. Uh, the administration's got a variety of different programs that kind of touch on some of these areas, certainly smaller dollars when you're talking about the national level. But uh, what are some of the ways that you're trying to get the word out for some of the federal programs? And how does that involve perhaps collaborating with state uh, uh, agencies? Um, we understand that partnerships are key and that uh, working with trusted messengers is the most effective way to get the word out. So um, we are, again, somebody that's in rural communities, uh, agency that uh, spends a lot of time either meeting with individual customers, farmers, events like this really help us get the word out. So I um, travel at least once a week. Uh, you probably see me a lot throughout the state and especially in some of the most historically underserved communities. Uh, so we do uh, work in partnership with CDFA as well. I know they're very good about pushing out information through their Planting Seeds newsletters about the funding opportunities that we have. We also do have a very informative website. We also encourage folks to sign up for our Gov Delivery announcements because that's where you're getting you know, emails uh, sent to you regularly when we're making funding announcements or when new program opportunities are coming online as well. Okay, great. Um, and changing gears over to something that's popped up in every conversation throughout the day is water. Uh, so what is your office's role when you're supporting irrigation districts, uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, implementation, water projects, like we're always talking about Sites Reservoir? Yes, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, for those of you that had an opportunity to to read my bio, you know that um, I have a really strong background in water. I spent many, many years working in the San Joaquin Valley and across the state to improve uh, water access for rural communities, but also the way that communities and ag producers and cities and everyone else plans together for the future of water. Um, so this is a really important topic. Um, at Rural Development, what we do is we have um, several programs under our water and environmental programs that are really designed to help rural communities have that access to safe drinking water, adequate wastewater infrastructure, you name it. Um, we provide uh, loans, grants, technical assistance as well through partners like uh, RCAC and California Rural Water, again, so that they're able to access the resources and they have the infrastructure that un not only ensures um, public health and safety, but also supports economic development. Um, so that's at the community level, and we know we want healthy communities. Our folks um, that live in rural communities are often the ones working the fields, um, and I know that's important to our ag producers. That, and they, too, often live in these rural communities. Um, through our community facilities programs, which is one of my favorite programs, we're able to be very creative in how we support essential community facilities in rural, rural California. And so as an example, we consider irrigation districts an, an essential community facility. And we've been able to use our um, loan programs to fund irrigation districts, um, including the Sites Water Authority, um, so that they can make uh, either improvements to their infrastructure or um, allow for uh, you know, intertype projects uh, so that, again, they have the infrastructure to deliver the water to agricultural producers so that we can keep the economy strong in these rural areas. I have a couple of examples of projects we funded. Um, so, for example, the Sites Water Authority. I'm really proud of this investment, uh, again, because it, they, it's a kind of a full circle for me and my connection to the Water Commission. But um, we did provide them a $450 million loan uh, to help develop the Maxwell Water Intertype Project. And again, that's a set of new facilities that will allow for the, inter the exchange of water between the Glen Calusa Irrigation District and the Tehama Calusa Canal Authority. And then in my uh, home county, we also provided the Lindsay Strathmore Irrigation District about a little over 11 million uh, to help them replace uh, 10 miles of uh, leaky steel irrigation pipeline. So that's just an example of how we can fund irrigation districts. Great, and while we're talking about water and your hometown, I wanted to roll back the time a little bit and talk about when you got involved with self-help enterprises. Uh, for those who aren't aware of that, maybe give a little explainer too, because it's such a, it plays such an important role. Comes up all the time at water board hearings for one thing. 
And uh, also, I'm seeing some Slido questions come up. We'll jump to those in a second, so please add more. But uh, yeah. Uh, yes, so as I mentioned, I have a really strong background in working on water issues. I first started my career at the Community Water Center where I spent about seven years working as an organizer and then um, and an advocate and then I decided to roll up my sleeves and be more of a technical assistance provider, understanding that rural communities struggle to access the resources that they need to draw down the resources, whether it's state or federal, local, to make the improvements. So I um, spent quite a bit of time there working with communities that were looking to improve access to drinking water or simply responding to the impacts of the drought. Uh, there was a lot of communities, including communities on private domestic wells that lost entire water supply. And so my job was to help them uh, provide the technical assistance, whether it was grant writing, uh, board presentations, uh, board capacity uh, trainings, to be able to help them bring the funds and then administer those projects and get them to, to construction. So it was um, a really rewarding experience and it's an experience that's really helped me be a more effective state director because as I mentioned, not only do we have programs that can fund those, those types of projects, we also do have uh, several emergen uh, an emergency project uh, program, I'm sorry, the Emergency Community Water Assistance Grant that can also respond to impacts from natural disasters, whether it's drought, earthquakes, uh, wildfires, and we know here in California, and um, along with the other states in the West, we do get reoccurring um, disasters, and so it's important to have programs that work on long-term solutions, but also programs that support emergency response. Okay, and uh, since you brought it up, I'm gonna jump into it a little bit. You mentioned the Water Commission and how you had served on that during a very critical time for the commission. I think it's probably like the heyday of the Water Commission, actually. Uh, yes. Can you, I know it's been a long time, so we won't dive into it too much, but can you just give us a little, little insight into what it was like working on the commission then? Certainly, and I, I kind of anticipated this, this question was gonna come up, so I had to go back and, and look at, okay, what, what was that? What, I, I knew it was a very rewarding um, and daunting task, but uh, yes, I spent five years on the Water Commission and I joined during a time where the voters had expressed their strong support for um, you know, water infrastructure projects and really building that water resiliency across California. So the, the commission had sort of three main tasks that I remember um, the most memorable. <laughs> One was being able to develop the, re the regulations for the water storage investment program and then with, with strong public input and then be, and make funding decisions on how the 2.7 billion would, we would be spent. Um, we were able to successfully award those dollars um, by the deadline the regulation set out and we were able to fund projects like the Vaqueros Storage Project uh, site and a few other groundwater recharge projects across the state of California. The other sort of big big task that we had was uh, working on the regulations for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is really a game changer and it came about after the last historic drought where now we're you know, requiring agencies and different water interests to come together to manage groundwater more sustainably. And then of course the traditional role of the Water Commission which was to oversee the state water project and it was during that time when Oroville had that spill. So there was a lot, um, never a dull moment and it was really great to work with um, the body of nine, the, the commissioners, the nine, and um, just be able to hear from the diverse water interests and know that I played a small role in being able to uh, make important funding decisions that will benefit the state of California for decades to come. Okay, great, and uh, sticking to water as well. We have a question on Slido here. So rural California will suffer as water-related regulation reduces regional ag jobs. Is this on your radar? I mean, certainly it's, it's something that I'm very well aware of. It's not something we work on directly at rural development. We're more focused, again, on providing the financing to support uh, communities and ag producers and make sure that the infrastructure is there. Um, but it's not, we're not directly involved in, in the regulations piece of it. Okay, and uh, switching over to the bigger picture, how do we, uh, this may be a little above your pay grade here, but how do we prioritize rural infrastructure without growing our national debt, like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act? 
Um, so I would say that the, the bipartisan infrastructure law was very beneficial to rural uh, America in the sense that it brought historic investments. For USDA rural development, that meant that we got more money to ex expand broadband access. Um, that was discussed earlier. And uh, through our ReConnect program, we're really building on history. Um, you probably recall back in the 1990s when um, we passed the Electrification Act. That was a big deal in the President Ro uh, Roosevelt's um, New Deal. That piece of legislation really enabled f uh, the federal government to offer low-cost loans to farmers who had banded together to create nonprofit um, cooperatives with the goal of bringing uh, electricity to rural areas because at that time, uh, you know, other parts were jo jo enjoying the benefits of electricity and it, rural America was in the dark. I see the investments in the bipartisan infrastructure law um, for internet access as exactly what we're doing again. We now have the tools to be able to bring internet into the rural areas where it's needed. We know that um, internet today is what electricity was then and uh, rural development has been doing a lot in the space of using those, those uh, bipartisan infrastructure law funding to ensure that areas that are so critical to um, the success of our economy, to agriculture, are not being left behind. Um, and this administration is also very much focused on, again, reaching underserved communities, tribes, and, and folks that just have not been able to avail themselves to, to the resources. And the truth is that we are um, having really difficult conversations right now, Congress in particular, um, and the administration around how to make sure that we can still keep these vital programs. Um, but again, I, I want to remind you that without funding for rural development, it would be really hard to uh, continue to ensure that the rural communities remain vital. That's so fascinating. It, it feels so distant of electrifying rural America, but at the same time, it's just such a hot topic today, too, when we're talking about more electricity for rural areas as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, yeah, taking it from the big picture down to a more narrower scope, uh, how can technologies, new technologies or innovations get recognized or approved for USDA funding when we're talking about startups, uh, new sensors, IoT devices? Uh, this is all evolving every year. Yeah, I, I think, you know, really where it starts is uh, give us a call. G tell us what you're thinking. What are your ideas? We're always looking at ways to support agriculture, um, whether it's the rural development or other agencies. As you know, the USDA family is quite large. We have Farm Service Agency, NRCS. So um, if it doesn't quite fit, either in the Rural Energy for America program or in our um, other like business and industry loan guarantee program, just give us a call. We'll, we'll, we'll um, talk to you about what is available or connect you with another USDA agency that, that can provide that assistance. Okay, great. And uh, kind of wrapping up here for the next few minutes, uh, talking a little bit more about the uh, impact to underserved communities. What impacts uh, are being made for underserved communities that can uh, expand for the greater good of all Californians? So what are we learning from rural areas that we can bring to other areas? That's a great question. Um, one of the first things that I was tasked with doing when I joined World Development is uh, is to go out and engage uh, 10 census tracts, historically underserved census tracts throughout the state of California to be able to gain a better understanding of what the needs are, um, priorities, what have some of the barriers been to accessing our programs, and more importantly, looking at ways that we can address them to increase investments in these areas, either through our programs or through other uh, federal programs, state programs, or even local resources. And thus far, we've engaged um, 12 new census tracts uh, up and down the state of California, primarily in the San Joaquin Valley and Imperial area, as well as the Central Coast and Monterey County. And what we've been learning through bringing together more than 250, whether it's you know residents, uh, school board members, elected officials, you name it, is that um, almost all communities have uh, needs for multiple things, whether it's community facilities, water infrastructure, housing, the need to support more economic development opportunities, and also a real interest in um, 
preserving uh, the opportunity for our young students to continue in agriculture. Those are among the things that people have, have, have identified as top priorities. And I'll, in terms of the, the barriers, it's been not knowing about our programs or not quite understanding what our mission area is. Um, just USDA brings maybe different thoughts for different people and not necessarily, oh, they can help me with the water project or they can help me with the energy efficiency project. And so um, we've learned a lot more about how to engage communities, how to reach them and meet them where they are and how to then target our technical assistance so that they're successful. An example of that is we did a, a webinar entirely with special um, with superintendents from special districts so that they could learn about our community facilities grant programs. And at the end of that webinar, we had applications from like 10 different school districts where we've made historic investments in these underserved rural schools. And so um, I think in, as it relates to the state is, you know, we wanna encourage folks to get out into communities you haven't served to really, um, modify the way that you engage folks. We had to provide translation um, at, at a lot of our sessions and hold our meetings in the evening so that we're reaching the folks. And again, just being creative with the way that we offer technical assistance. Great, uh, well said. And that's a very fascinating area to work in. You get to touch on so many things, get that real human aspect to it as well. All right, well, that's a, that's a wrap for this session. Uh, thank you, Maria, for sharing your perspective with our attendees out here. Uh, we will now take a brief intermission. Please join us back here at 10.45. Uh, it says specific time. I think everybody probably knows that. When we come back, Phil Brasher, Editor-in-Chief for AgriPulse, uh, will take the stage to moderate a panel discussion. Thank you.